Students of the way should be sure that the four elements composing the body do not constitute the self, that the self is not an entity, and that it can be deduced from this that the body is neither self nor entity. Moreover, the five aggregates composing the mind in the common sense do not constitute either a self or an entity. Hence it can be deduced that the so-called individual mind is neither self nor entity. The six sense organs, including the brain, which together with their six types of perception and the six kinds of objects of perception constitute the sensory world, must be understood in the same way. Those 18 aspects of sense are separately and together void. There is only mind source, limitless in extent and of absolute purity. 12. Thus there is sensual eating and wise eating. When the body composed of the four elements suffers the pangs of hunger, and accordingly you provide it with food, but without greed, that is called wise eating. On the other hand, if you gluttonously delight in purity and flavor, you are permitting the distinctions which arise from wrong thinking, merely seeking to gratify the organ of taste without realizing when you have taken enough, is called sensual eating. 13. Shravakas reach enlightenment by hearing the Dharma, so they are called Shravakas. Shravakas do not comprehend their own mind, but allow concepts to arise from listening to the doctrine. Whether they hear of the existence of Bodhi and Nirvana through supernormal powers or good fortune or preaching, they will attain to Buddhahood only after three eons of infinitely long duration. All these belong to the way of the Shravakas, so they are called Shravaka Buddhas. But to awaken suddenly to the fact that your own mind is the Buddha, that there is nothing to be attained or a single action to be performed, this is the supreme way. This is really to be as a Buddha. It is only to be feared that you students of the way, by the coming into existence of a single thought, may raise a barrier between yourselves and the way. From thought instant to thought instant, no form. From thought instant to thought instant, no activity. That is to be a Buddha. If you students of the way wish to become Buddhas, you need study no doctrines whatever but learn only how to avoid seeking for and attaching yourselves to anything. Where nothing is sought, this implies mind unborn. Where no attachment exists, this implies mind not destroyed. And that which is neither born nor destroyed is the Buddha. The 84,000 methods for countering the 84,000 forms of delusion are merely figures of speech for drawing people towards the gate. In fact, none of them have real existence. Relinquishment of everything is the Dharma, and he who understands this is a Buddha. But the relinquishment of all delusions leaves no Dharma on which to lay hold. 14. If you students of the way desire knowledge of this great mystery, only avoid attachment to any single thing beyond mind, to say that the real Dharmakaya of the Buddha resembles the void is another way of saying that the Dharmakaya is the void and that the void is the Dharmakaya. People often claim that the Dharmakaya is in the void and that the void contains the Dharmakaya, not realizing that they are one and the same. But if you define the void as something existing, then it is not the Dharmakaya. And if you define the Dharmakaya as something existing, then it is not the void. Only refrain from any objective conception of the void. Then it is the Dharmakaya. And if only you refrain from any objective conception of the Dharmakaya, why then it is the void. These two do not differ from each other. Nor is there any difference between sentient beings and Buddhas, or between samsara and nirvana, 
or between delusion and bodhi. When all such forms are abandoned, there is the Buddha. Ordinary people look to their surroundings, while followers of the way look to mind. But the true dharma is to forget them both. The former is easy enough, the latter very difficult. Men are afraid to forget their minds, fearing to fall through the void with nothing to stay their fall. They do not know that the void is not really void, but the realm of the real dharma. This spiritually enlightening nature is without beginning, as ancient as the void, subject neither to birth nor to destruction, neither existing nor not existing, neither impure nor pure, neither clamorous nor silent, neither old nor young, occupying no space, having neither inside nor outside, size nor form, color nor sound. It cannot be looked for or sought, comprehended by wisdom or knowledge, explained in words, contacted materially, or reached by meritorious achievement. All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, together with all wriggling things possessed of life, share in this great nirvanic nature. This nature is mind. Mind is the Buddha, and the Buddha is the Dharma. Any thought apart from this truth is entirely a wrong thought. You cannot use mind to seek mind, the Buddha to seek the Buddha, or the Dharma to seek the Dharma. So you students of the way should immediately refrain from conceptual thought. Let a tacit understanding be all. Any mental process must lead to error. There is just a transmission of mind with mind. This is the proper view to hold. Be careful not to look outwards to material surroundings. To mistake material surroundings for mind is to mistake a thief for your son. It is only in contradistinction to greed, anger, and ignorance that abstinence, calm, and wisdom exist. Without illusion, how could there be enlightenment? Therefore, Bodhidharma said, the Buddha enunciated all dharmas in order to eliminate every vestige of conceptual thinking. If I refrained entirely from conceptual thought, what would be the use of all the dharmas? Attach yourselves to nothing beyond the pure Buddha nature, which is the original source of all things. Suppose you were to adorn the void with countless jewels, how could they remain in position? The Buddha nature is like the void. Though you were to adorn it with inestimable, inestimable merit and wisdom, how could they remain there? They would only serve to conceal its original nature and to render it invisible. That which is called the doctrine of mental origins, followed by certain other sects, postulates that all things are built up in mind and that they manifest themselves upon contact with external environment, ceasing to be manifest when that environment is not present. But it is wrong to conceive of an environment separate from the pure, unvarying nature of all things. That which is called the mirror of concentration and wisdom, another reference to non-Zen Mahayana doctrine, requires the use of sight, hearing, feeling, and cognition, which lead to successive states of calm and agitation. But these involve conceptions based on environmental objects. They are temporary expedients appertaining to one of the lower categories of roots of goodness. And this category of roots of goodness merely enables people to understand what is said to them. If you wish to experience enlightenment yourselves, you must not indulge in such conceptions. They are all environmental dharmas concerning things which are and things which are not, based on existence and non-existence. If only you will avoid concepts of existence and non-existence in regard to absolutely everything, then will you perceive the Dharma. On the first day of the ninth moon, the Master said to me, from the time when the great master Bodhidharma arrived in China, he spoke only of the one mind 
and transmitted only the one Dharma. He used the Buddha to transmit the Buddha, never speaking of any other Buddha. He used the Dharma to transmit the Dharma, never speaking of any other Dharma. That Dharma was the wordless Dharma, and that Buddha was the intangible Buddha, since they were in fact that pure mind which is the source of all things. This is the only truth. All else is false. Pragna is wisdom. Wisdom is the formless original mind source. Ordinary people do not seek the way, but merely indulge their six senses, which lead them back into the six realms of existence. A student of the way, by allowing himself a single samsaric thought, falls among devils. If he permits himself a single thought leading to differential perception, he falls into heresy. To hold that there is something born and to try to eliminate it, that is to fall among the shravakas. To hold that things are not born but capable of destruction is to fall among the pratyekas. Nothing is born, nothing is destroyed. Away with your dualism, your likes and dislikes. Every single thing is just the one mind. When you have perceived this, you will have mounted the chariot of the Buddhas. Ordinary people all indulge in conceptual thought based on environmental phenomena. Hence, they feel desire and hatred. To eliminate environmental phenomena, just put an end to your conceptual thinking. When this ceases, environmental phenomena are void. And when these are void, thought ceases. But if you try to eliminate environment without first putting a stop to conceptual thought, you will not succeed, but merely increase its power to disturb you. Thus, all things are not but mind, intangible mind. So what can you hope to attain? Those who are students of prajna hold that there is nothing tangible whatever. So they cease thinking of the three vehicles, there is only the one reality, neither to be realized nor attained. To say, I am able to realize something, or I am able to attain something, is to place yourself among the arrogant. The men who flapped their garments and left the meeting, as mentioned in the Lotus Sutra, were just such people. Therefore the Buddha said, I truly obtained nothing from enlightenment. There is just a mysterious, tacit understanding, and no more. If an ordinary man, when he is about to die, could only see the five elements of consciousness as void, the four physical elements as not constituting an I, the real mind as formless and neither coming nor going, his nature as something neither commencing at his birth nor perishing at his death, but as whole and motionless in its very depths, his mind and environmental objects as one, if he could really accomplish this, he would receive enlightenment in a flash. He would no longer be entangled by the triple world. He would be a world transcender. He would be without even the faintest tendency towards rebirth. If he should behold the glorious sight of all the Buddhas coming to welcome him, surrounded by every kind of gorgeous manifestation, he would feel no desire to approach them. If he should behold all sorts of horrific forms surrounding him, he would experience no terror. He would just be himself, oblivious of conceptual thought and one with the Absolute. He would have attained the state of unconditioned being. This, then, is the fundamental principle.